Let's get ready to rumble! I have been a Ben Davison critique, yep. But fair is fair, like, when he teamed up with Lee Wood, Lee was a domestic fighter who had lost twice at domestic level, once to Gavin McDonnell, brother of Jamie. Jamie won world titles, Gavin didn't, he was domestic level. Lee Wood also lost to Jazza Dickens. Nobody was predicting Lee Wood to become an attraction in British boxing or world boxing for that matter. So Lee's first fight with Ben Davidson, they win the British title against 13-0 Reese Mould. That was a crossroads fight right there. Another loss, he could just become an opponent or maybe a journeyman. You know, he upset the odds against Zhu Kan. He was underdog. He was the underdog against Conlon and he's won both them fights. I think it's a bit unfair that a lot of people critiquing Ben Davison. Did you watch Lee Wood before he was with Ben Davison? How good was he then before you're saying, well, Ben's got him doing everything wrong technically? How good was he before he met Ben Davison? Do you know this? Because I'm not too sure, to be honest. But it does appear that Ben has brought Lee on as a pro. And Lee also says it as well. He's very grateful to the strides he's made with Ben Davidson. I believe Lee was saying the amount of time Ben will spend with the fighter and the amount of hours he'll put into strategizing. Apparently, Ben barely took any money for the Reese Mode fight, but he was totally committed to the job. And you need a man like that in there, someone who's committed. And Lee Wood is benefiting from that. His self-belief is a lot different, and that's integral to a fighter making improvements in his career. Would the Lee Wood who lost to Gavin McDonald and Jazza Dickens beat Zucan and Michael Conlon? We'll never know. I'll take a stab at it and say no, he wouldn't. And that has to be attributed to Ben Davison. He had a lot to overcome in that ring. Heavy knockdown. Probably the best punch Conlon's ever threw in his career. Heavy, heavy knockdown. Not so much out punch, but out skilled. And Conlon was picking some beautiful shots. The backhand left from the southpaw stance was beautiful. His body punching was excellent. And Lee pulled it back. You know, you got people saying it's only because he was bigger than Conlon. Well, somebody's got to be bigger and someone's got to be smaller. What do you want fighters to do about that? Make himself the same size as Conlon? He can't. He's a big featherweight. But that doesn't guarantee you victory. And it wasn't like he just turned it around with one punch. No. Like, there was a moment, I believe it was either the ninth or 10th, where Conlon landed his best shot. And Lee looked hurt, but he took it and fired back with his own shots. And that's when I believe he broke Conlon's will. Lee got some weapons as well. Let's not discount that. He's got like that, that right uppercut. Good punch. Straight right. Good punch. And when he floored Conlon in the 11th, which people were trying to say wasn't a knockdown, it looked like a knockdown to me. The writing was on the wall. Writing was on the wall. He basically dragged Conlon into his world and into his fight and Conlon couldn't maintain that pace that he set off for the full 12 and Lee made mistakes you know there was times like in the 8th and ninth and whatever rounds where he was just giving Conlon too much time to steal the breather but he got it done in the end great finish you'll get your chance to critique Ben Davison if you just don't like the guy but let him have his night man let him have his night people have a lot of issues of what they think skill is or what a good boxer is you know a lot of people they think it's oh maybe a philly shell or someone who can fight on the back foot and jab and yes that can equate to a good boxer but being a good boxer might be a guy who's good at boxing up close like that girl who fought sandy ryan and put the first l on her record she was more experienced she was smaller she had really long arms and she used it all to her advantage Wherever she saw a gap, whenever Sandy Ryan went wide with her punches, her opponent punched. Now, a lot of people who watch boxing, they say, ah, it's not skill, it's just frame, but no, 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 you're incorrect. That is actually a skill. It takes timing and knowledge, and it takes an ability to read your opponent, to stay in punching range and know when they're going to go wide and time your attack. It's a skill. It might not be the skill you like, but it's a skill. Lee Wood, not a perfect fighter. No, of course he's not. But you're not going to beat someone who was as accomplished an amateur as Michael Conlon and as touted as he was to win the fight. The favourite. You're not going to beat him 
just on punch power and brute strength. There's got to be a level of skill there. There's got to be a level of strategy to know that we can't really box with this guy early. He's too fast. He's too sharp. But, you know, we're going to get the timing down. We'll read him. When we can hit him to the body, we'll do that. Hit him with some hard body shots. You see when Lee was pushing Michael Conlon, you saw how strong Lee was. But you've got to be patient in there. And Lee had that patience. And Ben Davison and Lee got the job done. Colin was psyching himself up like a madman before the fight. He was playing his rock guitar, his imaginary rock guitar. Had his crazy face on. Because he was coming out there not to fuck around. First round, his side-to-side -side movement and his speed. His upper body movement. He was like a ghost. His left hand was impeccable. The knockdown, oof, it was two different levels. Second round, had Lee Wood hurt again. And he wanted the stoppage. He wanted the stoppage. But as great as his boxing was, he made a few technical errors. Like as soon as his back touched the ropes, he needed to be spinning off the ropes. As soon as he felt that rope touch his back. And he didn't. And Lee Wood was laying back into him with combinations. Now, they weren't as crisp as Michael's shots, but they were heavy, very heavy-handed. And even though he was having success, he's now fighting a fight that is alien to him because he's trying to win the belt. And this happens to a lot of challengers when they're trying to win world titles. Maybe um, it was a strategy worked out before with his coach, but something happens and they change they turn into a totally different fighter. I've seen it. I've seen it a few times. Historically, Billy Conn was a boxer. He turned into an animal against Joe Lewis. Terry Marsh did it against Joe Lewis Manley. Flip the script. Fuck all this straight left, you know, gentlemanly shit. I need to be a two-handed slugger. And even though he was doing well at that, this is Lee's fight. Even if Lee's losing, this is Lee's fight. Even if Lee's taking punches, as long as he can touch something, he can mentally still feel himself in the fight. It's not lost. Other fighters who've totally flipped the script from who they normally were in the ring. Wilfred Benitez versus Morris Holt. He was looking to knock Morris out with big shots. And he got there. He did get there. Billy Conn didn't get there. Tony Simpson, who I was talking about, taking a breather, he didn't get there. Terry Marsh did. Obviously, the atmosphere plays a big part of that transformation. Lee's punch trajectory and accuracy at times improved when Michael was on the ropes. But in open play, center of the ring, oh, he was just like a duck out of water. Yeah, the criticism for Ben Davidson is very hard because Michael Conlon coming out the way he came out was gonna be hard to subdue. He was in the zone. So even when he got cut, I don't know what cut him, what cut him? Because Lee Wood certainly didn't seem to have landed anything of any consequence at that time to have cut him in the second round. But Mike wasn't affected by that cut in the first half of the fight. Maybe when the adrenaline started wearing off, he realized, oh man, I'm bleeding and this pace is really hard. Maybe he started feeling it then. Because when the adrenaline wears off, you need to be at your most professional when the adrenaline wears off. Because the adrenaline is what helps you to absorb a lot of the big shots and the trench warfare, and if it wears off, you need to be extremely professional. By the 6th and the 7th, this is a toe-to-toe. -to -toe. It's just a brilliant fight, to be honest with you. It's really good. And you can see Conlon pushing his gum shield near out of his mouth, needing breath, and he's landing good shots. But at the end of the 7th, you see Lee Wood pump his fist in the air like, yo, I'm still here, bro. Conlon reminded me of Billy Conn. I've watched this fight about three or four times. He reminded me of Billy Conn, the way he was trying to put his combinations from body then coming up to head. He was trying to get his man out of there. But Lee Wood kept coming back with shots. He wasn't going to be denied. He wasn't going to be stopped. He was driving Conlon back into the ropes. And Lee himself was feeling the pace. Because I was saying on the live that Lee doesn't want to be letting Conlon take these rests in between exchanges to recover. And I was thinking by the ninth that, oh man, he's probably blew this. You watch that 10th round, bro, right? Yeah, Conlon's doing his thing, man. He's trying to punch his landing. But Lee is punishing him to that body like Conlon's never been punished before. And if that adrenaline is wearing off and he's taking them big body shots in the 10th, that must just be absolutely devastating. Like, you're so close to the championship. 
There's people saying, ah, oh, Colin needed to take a breather and take a rest. He couldn't. He couldn't. He didn't have the option of fight or flight. He just had to fight. That's all he could do. The legs are not there. You got to bite on that gum shield and fight. Like Georgie Benton told Tyrell Biggs when Mike Tyson was battering him to the body. And he went back to the corner. I ain't got no legs. I ain't got no legs. You ain't got no legs. Well, fight him inside. <laughs> Tenth round. Lee's already laid the table with the first body assault. So they're back now, moving around, looking for openings. And Lee lands a big right hand over the top, drives Michael back into the ropes. Now this is attrition right now. Like that adrenaline wearing off. You still want that belt. You've took that big right. It drives you into the ropes. So the punch is hurt enough. And then Lee's head follows through after the punch. And it hits Michael in his face. And like everything, you're just feeling everything. Like from outside the ropes, you know, we're not clocking all that shit there. Everything is hurting now. Everything is hurting. You see, Lee is fighting in the same gear he started in the first round. He was always on the front foot whenever possible. He hasn't been out of his element in the fight, apart from the beating he took, obviously. But Michael... Michael can't create these angles no more. These beautiful angles no more. They're not there for him now. They're not there. They're gone. Left the building, bro. Where's that exit I was using in the second round? Oh, that gone. Long time, Mike. That's gone. We took that away. What about that one? No, that's gone as well. This is what you call the inevitable. Although we didn't know that. I didn't know that at the time. But this is the inevitable. He's losing his shape. All of a sudden, that ring that looks so vast and plentiful for Michael, turn into a phone booth. Earlier I said the key moment was the 10th, but no, it was the 11th. They were exchanging shots and Colin hurt Lee Wood, but this time Lee walked through them, came back with his own shots. And I think this is the breaking point for Michael right now. And the knockdown in the 11th, Colin said it was a slip, but Lee was in the ascendancy. He was throwing bombs with both hands. And whatever put him down there, whether it hurt him really badly or not, it was a slip. The psychological impact that this fight is slipping away, only a boxer in the championship rounds can explain what that must have felt like. The fight's slipping away. He can't keep this pit bull, the pit bull with a fringe off him. Can't keep him off. He knows the scorecards are tight now as well with a 10-8 in the bank for Lee. Lee's body language tells a story in itself. Michael's body language tells a story in itself. Physically, Mike can't use his legs and move like he was earlier. Mentally, Mike can't use his legs and move like he was earlier. Lee, he's right where he wants to be. Right where he wants to be. Michael's shaking his head at the end of the round. Adam Booth, he's sending distress signals to Conlon as well which was um, maybe, uh, I, I don't know what to put it down to, not as professional as Adam could have been. It's too late. They've already scored it 10-8. Calm your fighter down as much as you can. The fight is still in the balance. Adam didn't really do that, did he? Shouting at the referee. An already stressed Conlon has got a stressed cornerman as well. When you hear Adam Booth in interviews, he's very calm, cool, almost unflappable. But these championship rounds will test the metal of not just the fighters, but the trainers too. It's real shit. So he was an emotional wreck himself. Ben Davidson at times was an emotional wreck. You see Ben right up on the ring ropes like he wanted to jump in the ring and stop Michael punching up Lee, especially in the early rounds. The follow-up punches put him out through the ropes and we didn't see him again for that night. Off to the dressing room, hospital, observation, Thankfully, he was okay. Lee would calm down the crowd. David Del Monte, somehow walking around like he was never in this life or death motorcycle incident that was reported. Very strange, very strange. He announced the winner by TKO in the 12th and final round, Lee Wood and still. Epic, 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 epic. And... I like Laron Richards and I was watching him with Dave Caldwell about how the 168 pounders are ignoring him 
and he wants a big fight. Well, here's the thing, right? The Gongora win for Leron Richards was excellent. Technically, as sound as you will see from a British boxer. But look at Saturday. Leron Stablemate, Lay Wood, both matchroom fighters. Look at that performance there. How are you going to become an attraction as a relatively light punching, technically very skilled super middleweight? How are you going to get them turning up at the gate? How are you going to get to pay-per-view level? How are you going to get the big fights? He's going to have to wait until the sanctioning bodies mandate him into position because these are really good fights, man. These are really good fights. We've been treated to some really good fights recently, like the Roman Gonzalez performance. A lot of people think we're going over the top. Roman was fucking sensational. And this fight here was excellent, man. And then you add Sky with Khan and Brooke. People want to see passion. They want to see passion. This is why Sonny Edwards is becoming this outspoken dude on Twitter and social media. Because he's boring in the ring. And he's got to compensate for it in other ways. That's why he's been trolling Eddie Hearn. And it looks like it's worked. Sonny turned up at the Conlon show, even though he's a pro villain fighter. He's fighting on Eurosport on Saturday. He met up with Eddie, saying, I, I want Julio Cesar Martinez. And Eddie said, yeah, no problem. As long as you're good, as long as you're nice, you know, tongue-in-cheek, because Sonny's been trolling him a lot. Eddie said, once Martinez gets his next fight out of the way, I don't know if that's a mandatory, then he's looking to unify. And Sonny's the guy. The Ron Richards are going to have to work it out. Well... Yeah, it's a I told you so moment, but I'm hoping common sense will prevail and the fight will still go ahead. I knew Golden Boy were not going to let Mangia cross over that side of the street without some heavy concessions in return. The PBC have been around for what? Must be around five years and only this year they want to start doing cross promotions. Why wait so long? I'll tell you why why wait so long because the business is sinking now. So now they're having to reach out. Now, the PBC offered what to me looked like a generous deal they offered golden boy and the zone the tv rights to mexico and the uk both very profitable markets for the zone and it was turned down oscar is telling them that they want the zone the network involved in the american promotion of the fight so oscar is basically at the beck and call of the network more than the boxing fans the boxing fans want to see this i want to see that fight and this is a big problem in boxing right now your interests are tied in with the network more than the boxing fans that's no good for us why don't the zone make a counter offer higher than whatever the pbc is putting up it's as simple as that and you can take control of the whole broadcast the pay-per-view revenue and everything then what is it golden boy wants they can't surely expect the pbc to share broadcasting rights in america and foot the bill for both fighters' purses as well. Because Oscar didn't say anything about the purses not being suitable. He said, Jamal's the champion. Obviously, he gets the bigger purse. No problem. It was all the other stuff. He didn't bring up what Mangia wanted, the fighter. He was bringing up what the zone wanted. What's up with Eric Morales as well? I mean, he's an all-time great fighter, in my opinion. How comes he's not more vocal about it? Doesn't he think Jaime's ready? What's going on? So maybe they want to do shoulder programming. Because they have invested... This is what I said. I said, they're not just going to let... And I'm no, no disrespect to Charlo, but you have no defining wins or fights or anything like that. You're not a household name. They're not just going to let some random black guy put hands on Mangia on the PBC network and then send him back to Golden Boy. They're not going to do that. They've invested in Mangia. They're grooming Mangia to be their next pay-per-view guy. The next big ticket seller. The big draw. That's what they're grooming him to be. Now, before some of you go off, I'm not breaking it all down to race. But if you can't see the dynamic in boxing over there, then you're stupid. And it'd be stupid not to point it out. It's obvious what's happening out there. There are no Mexican promoters or fighters saying, oh, I need to fight this African-American. And look, America is split in terms of the best boxers being either Mexican or African-American for the most part. Where are the Mexican fighters or the Mexican promoters calling out African-Americans? They're not. There's no Mayweather there. That's why the PBC haven't replaced. But the PBC are desperate to get Jaime on there now. They want Jaime. 
They want Canelo. Who next? Disappointed in Al Heyman. I thought he was a lot, you know, shrewder than that, but he's basically set a template for where the Mexican fighter is automatically more valuable than the African American. I mean, Jaime hasn't done any pay per view. Why do you want Jaime over there, but you don't want Terence Crawford? You don't want Haney? Andrade? Theoretically, he's just made it really hard for African American fighters now. If they need a crossroads or career defining fight against a Mexican, it's made it really hard for them. Or making it hard for them. As Mike Coppinger points out, the broadcasting rights become a sticking point in an increasingly fractured sport. Yep. Oscar said, Golden Boy remains committed to our partner, The Zone. You can't collaborate if they're putting up all the money. That's what he doesn't get. The way Oscar sees it is that Mangia has a bigger upside than Charlo. That's how they see it. That's how Oscar, Golden Boy, and The Zone see it. They're saying, yo, Mangia's going to be the star, not Charlo. He's the one with the ready-made fan base who they're going to prep for being a pay-per-view guy. He's younger than Charlo as well. And they're keeping him very busy. Jaime's had five fights since 2019. Jamal's had two fights. Two fights since 2019. Golden Boy have a plan with Jaime. What's the plan with Jamal? Huh? What's the plan with Jamal? He's 31. Getting caught up in the legal system may be a little too much. People telling Crawford to sign with the PBC if you want to get these big fights. Well, what's the guarantee that that's going to happen if he signs with the PBC? They were talking about Plant versus Benavides, but Jake Donovan, who writes for Boxing Scene, is saying, my story on what's up next for Caleb Plant and why a proposed fight with David Benavides was little more than social media entertainment. I mean, that's embarrassing to talk about a proposed match as social media entertainment and you're both on the same network. So this is what Crawford had to look forward to if he crossed over there. They're talking about Caleb fighting Anthony Durrell. Most people would prefer to see Caleb and Benavides, but Caleb is going to fight Anthony Durrell. Benavides versus Lemieux doesn't really do much for me at 168. And apparently Charlo versus Selecki. Really? Al needs to knock some heads together and say, look, either you guys get in the ring and fight each other, or you can dispense with my advisory services right now, because this is going nowhere, really. Selecki. So, three fights since 2019. Montiel, Derivyachenko, and Selecki. Not good enough. I've heard Plant talking crap to Charlo. Charlo talking crap to Plant. Benavides and Charlo going back and forth. But try and match two out of the three in a fight. Just doesn't happen. So just because you can't get Canelo over there to fight Benavides or Charlo, everything just implodes and turns to shit. Weird. What about the Mungia fan base? Are they co-signing him not fighting Andrade, not fighting Charlo? You know, whether it's his side of the street or the other side of the street, he's just not taking his title shots. And they're still ranking him number one. The WBC and the WBO still keeping him high up there. It's crazy. What's he going to do next? Is he going to fight Adamas? Will that go down to a purse split? And if the PBC win it, will Golden Boy allow him to go over there? And look, you can try and probe me about this. Why are you bringing up race? Let me tell you this now. If Charlo and Andrade were Mexican, you think he'd be able to just duck like this and still maintain a Mexican fan base? You're going to be out of your mind. If you can't see it, you can't see it. I can't help you. I'm not here to baby motherfuckers. I'm not here to race bait. I'm here to tell the truth. I'll just say it like this. It's no point the likes of Benavides and Charlo and the PBC fans holding out for a Canelo fight when they can't get a combination out of Plant, Benavides or Charlo to fight each other over there. This is something they're going to have to resolve. Waiting for Canelo is just the worst idea ever. The Zone obviously don't want to be shut out of the picture because Oscar's saying, well, the Zone have built Jaime. You can't just shut them out altogether. You've got to let them do some promotion or give them some content to put on the app or maybe reconstruct the TV deal and then you'll get a fight. And that's where it is right now. They're not just going to throw Jaime over there like that. And yeah, let's um, shut the zone out of the whole thing. Because that's what's been happening recently, isn't it? Like, um, we know Eddie is rolling with Canelo. And the PBC basically tried to shut Eddie out from the whole Caleb Plant event, didn't they? They wouldn't let him into certain areas of the arena. Same thing with Fury and White. You know, you hear Frank Warren, no, Eddie's not involved in Bob Aaron. We don't want him. We don't want him here. We don't want him there. And 
The same is going to happen if the PBC or top rank want to do business with an Eddie Hearn fighter. And a lot of fights are just not going to happen. Hopefully this Jaime Jamal thing can resolve itself. That fight should be easy to make. They both need a defining signature fight. It should be easy to make. And then you read shit like this from Anthony Durrell. If nobody hear me say we have a fight, then it's not a done deal. Are we talking about it? Yes, but no deal has been done. And you have to wonder, has Caleb just picked out Darrell's name to avoid Benavides, perhaps? The fight's not even over the line. And he's there announcing he's going to fight Darrell. So what does that say? That says if there was an offer from Benavides, Caleb just took the easier fight. But what else would you expect from Caleb? No actual confirmation from HBO representatives, but the narrative was that they got out because... The broadcasting boxing game was not as lucrative as it had been in previous years. So, why is it then the likes of Wasserman and Pro Bellum want all the smoke? You know, Wasserman just signed a lucrative deal with Channel 5. Pro Bellum, they've got the Discovery Channel and Eurosport. Pro Bellum cards to be picked up by Fubo TV and ESPN. Regis Pro Grace fights Tyrone McKenna in Dubai this Saturday. That'll be on Eurosport. Is this good or is it bad for boxing? Well, it's good because, you know, the quantity will be abundant. But what about unifications and the best fighting the best? If they're all about trying to appease their network, like Oscar is with the Mungia Charlo situation, how is that good for the fans? So there's literally five different outlets in the UK. Five different outlets. In the 80s, there was two. And in all truth, for long periods in the 80s, there was really one. Because the cartel ran it. And for the most part, ITV were just showing delayed recordings from America. Are we in danger of saturating the market? There's always been promotional outlets, yeah? But it's how much fighters they're signing to their rosters. You know what I mean? Like, the Duvers never had two, three hundred fighters on their books. Don King never had that number in his prime. Or Bob Arum, these huge numbers. And with 17, or well, bridge away, 18 weight classes, four different sanctioning bodies, which most people recognize for the most part. Is the market being saturated? Is the quality a little diluted? Now, unless you're a journalist and this is your full-time profession that you need to see a lot of boxing, if you're a British boxing fan, are you going to have Pro Bellum, Wasserman, Queensbury, BT, Matrum, and Boxer. You're going to have all five? Will there be enough hours in the day for you to watch all that boxing content? Probably not. Apart from Channel 5, which is free to air, you'll be paying a subscription one way or the other. And unless you get an illegal stream or you do what you got to do, you can't get Eurosport unless you have some kind of satellite package. So you've got to shell out. And then, what about the pay-per-views that are going to be coming from BT, Sky? And trust me, if Channel 5, Eurosport, and we know the zone, done the bait and switch on us, if they all get fights that they deem as top quality, they're going to put them on pay-per-view. That's what they're going to do. Like Tyson won the HBO unification tournament in the 80s, and he stayed there until 90. He was supposed to renew the HBO deal, but apparently Larry Merchant and Mike didn't get on. Mike didn't like certain questions he was being asked, and the deal fell through. Then he went to Showtime. Hollyfield fought on the HBO. But there didn't seem to be this rigid structure that fighters stayed on one network necessarily and they were prisoned to it. Like the PBC fighters seemed prisoned on the island. So when they fought, they fought on Showtime. Mike was the bigger draw. So Showtime it was. The rematch was on Showtime. Lennox Lewis, not really a Don King guy like that. His fights with Evander Holyfield, both fights were on Showtime. But when he fought Mike Tyson, Showtime and HBO, they split the broadcasting rights. 50-50. The more recent example of a compromise like that between HBO and Showtime was Pacquiao and Floyd. They split the broadcasting rights 50-50. But, you know, when we look at that fight, it wasn't as simple as that. It took too long to make. Way too long. Network politics, purse splits, promotional egos... Now, I want to make sure I'm not looking at everything with rose-coloured spectacles and whatever, because that's no good either. But you have to say, like, the promoters and networks had a way more pragmatic approach 
let's say early millennium, pre-millennium. Like, okay, you put up the biggest offer, the fight lands on your network and there's no real argument to that. I can't put my finger on anything specifically to where it all changed and got so complicated, but I, I am going to say the social media politics that the likes of Steven Espinosa and Eddie Hearn were getting involved with. You see Leonard Ellaby up there, people trying to negotiate, well, not negotiate fights online, more trying to get propaganda points over each other. Aram, Shelly Finkel, Lou DiBella, Oscar, the usual suspects has damaged how boxing fights are negotiated. It's damaged it severely. You know, the egos are too involved. I mean, if Mangia does want to fight, why isn't he more vocal? Why doesn't he come out and say something? If Charlo really wants to fight, why don't both of them come out and say something? Why don't both of them get in contact with each other? It's not like they live on two different planets. And say, yo, we want both want the fight. Why don't we, we, say, yo, we're going to have a press conference and let the fans know, yo, we're just going to finalize a date, location, and get it done. But do the fighters have any power? When the Muhammad Ali Act in America, which is enforceable, cannot prevent this fight from happening if both the fighters want it. Ain't anybody sick of CEOs, program execs, and promoters telling us what fighters are going to do? And we haven't got no clue what the fighter really wants to do. He really wants to fight. Every second, videos, propaganda, damage control, same thing. Couldn't do this in the TV era, no social media. Couldn't do all this. One shining light for the PBC is they've got the undisputed fight with Castano still on schedule. Boxing scene are dubbing it the biggest non-pay-per-view card of the year. Scheduled for May the 14th in Southern California. I don't know what the undercard is, but you know, I guess they're just talking about the main event covering the whole event. That alone makes it the biggest non-pay-per-view card of the year. Can't really argue with that, can you? Can't really argue. I mean... If you're getting that and not having to pay pay-per-view, you're not really going to cry about the undercard, are you? You're not going to really give two shits who they put on there. This is the shining light for the PBC, this fight. I can't see nothing else of any interest. Tank versus Romero. Jamal against Selecki. Benavides against Lemieux for the interim belt. So what? If David wins the interim belt against Lemieux, that's going to bring about some big push for Canelo to fight him. Leave me alone, man. Please. I don't mind what way AJ wants to go if he wants to go straight back in to the deep end with a top ranked contender whether that's Wilder Joyce Wallin Ortiz or if he wants to go down to pecking order get a couple of knockover jobs sharpen up his tools a little more in case Yusek comes back or the Fury fight opens up or maybe Dillian beats Fury he could take on the winner of them too as long as he's heading in the right direction then I'm good there's an unexpected back and forth between him and Joyce and they've been accused of not being the most fan-friendly smack talkers. And they're not really talking mad smack, but they're going back and forth. Because Joshua said, in response to him having any apprehension about taking on Joe Joyce, and the fact that people bring that up, that <laughs> AJ shook at Joe Joyce or anyone in the weight class, is mind-boggling. Look at the space of time that he's had all his success and look at the people he's fought and look at the offers that have been put out there that have been turned down as well as the people he's beat and lost against so joshua he said i've shared the ring with most people you see in the heavyweight division today i boxed otto while in twice as youngsters i boxed joe joyce i stopped him in one round i do the same thing today ain't nothing changed da, 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 da. joyce got upset Anthony Joshua, you're having a meltdown. Where are all your belts? All those sponsorships and endorsements helping. You're a glass cannon. Quit the act. You were given everything. <laughs> Anthony Joshua went, it took you five days to think of this. But to me, it seems what really triggered Joe is Shane McGuigan's assessment of the fight. He believes that AJ will get to him early and beat Joe Joyce up. And Joe didn't like that. He said, I used to have respect for that at McGuigan's gym. I take it all back. You have no respect for what I have achieved and I will achieve. I'm so glad I didn't sign with your at clone cyclone family. Tell your son to wind his neck in and concentrate on picking up Triple D off his knees. So the rivalry there is building up and that's what it needs. We don't need them being all pally pally and friendly friendly. This is where it needs to be if they try and make this fight. 
And basically, I already want to see Frank Warren's face, yeah? Because there's not even a, a bidding contest here. It goes on match from the zone. There's no contest on who's the draw, who's the A side, blah, blah. Frank can stay out of it like he's telling Eddie to stay out of Fury and White. And we just get the fight on and see who's the better man. Michael Mickinson takes on Virgil Ortiz. Mickinson, a big underdog, obviously. Ortiz is a very good fighter. Not the most skilled, but very strong, very powerful. Mickinson, unbeaten Southpaw. Not much knockouts from the United Kingdom. Not being given a chance by many. Nothing to lose. Any upsets will reverberate around the boxing world. This fight is not going to trend at all. This fight is under the radar. But if Mickinson even gives him stiff resistance, people are going to be talking about it. I mean, he's such an underdog. Could you even make a viable case that he could put up stiff resistance at least, even if not predicting him to win? Last minute edit. That fight's been cancelled. Apparently, Ortiz has been seen in the gym looking super big. Like, he couldn't make the weight. That hasn't been confirmed by Golden Boy and probably won't be. They'll probably make some other excuse. His old man said he's got rhabdomyolosis. Well, if that's what he's saying, we'll have to take his word. I'm a little disappointed. I think that would cancel the card this weekend on the zone, won't it? So, a bit disappointed. Is he morphing into Ryan Garcia now? Like, can't rely on him? What's up with these Golden Boy fighters, man? One Carlos Salgado, he's going to step in for Virgil Ortiz. He apparently has a one-round win over Jorge Linares. I don't remember that fight, I'm going to be perfectly honest. That was at junior lightweight. The Mickinson team have rejected Blair Cobbs and Alexis Rocha because they're all southpaws and they were prepping all camp to fight the orthodox right-handed Ortiz. Mickinson's fight might be demoted from the main event. They might elevate the likes of Cobbs Rocha to the headlining act. I mean, look at this shit. Look at the mess they've had there. They've had fucking old ass Shagayev there. Frez Quendo, old busted Frez. Shannon on testosterone. Got popped before he even got to the ring. The Australian youth there. PD'd up and all these old rusty Manuel Char and what's his name? Um, Christopher Lovejoy and Houston off and what is it? The regular interim belt? I really couldn't care and I'm not doing the research to <laughs> determine <laughs> what it is either way. Yeah, this is what I'm reading. You've got to pay a 15 grand participation fee to enter a purse bid situation if you're a promoter. Participation fee. The winning bid must bring a 10% deposit within 24 hours of the hearing, which will be conducted via Zoom. So the bid will be split 55-45 in your man Trevor B's favour and Daniel will get 45%. So... They've had to postpone it for a week due to Team Brian needing different requirements, as it says here. A million dollar minimum is what has to be put up, and it's not going to exceed the minimum by much, is it? If any. <laughs> a million should clinch it. Is this the first time that Frank and Don will be clashing since Don cleaned him out in that lawsuit years back? Bit too early to break the fight down, but if Daniel can't beat this guy... Then Frank's been sold a dud, hasn't he, really? I mean, um, I expect Daniel to win it only because of Brian's application is a bit lapse in terms of his physical conditioning. And I'm not totally ruling out the upset. Dave Allen is not finished with boxing, apparently. So this is going to be his second fight on Saturday on Fight Zone, which is small hall boxing. Dennis Hobson Jr., son of Senior, who used to work with Ricky Hatton and Clinton Woods. Basically, small hall boxing outside London is what they deal with. They put their cards on YouTube, or at least they did. Like, Dave Allen, after he lost to David Price in 2019, that kind of signaled the end of his Sky days. He had one more fight in February of 2020 on Sky against Dorian Dutch, which was investigated. There were suspicions the fight could have been fixed. Then he took um, over a year out. He appeared on Fight Zone August of last year. His opponent was 17, 13, and 3. And his opponent this weekend is going to be 5, 8, and 0. Because Dave found his level. 
Will we ever see him on one of the major promotions again, like Sky or BT, the zone? I mean, he got a bucket load of chances at Sky and Matram to do something with his career, and many may say he got too many chances. So, in my opinion, Fight Zone is a good fit for Dave right now. It's a good fit. So, I'm not going to start this article at the top. I'm going to start it from here. I'm pretty sure that's what he wants to do. It's not for me as a promoter to tell a fighter when he should retire. Damn right, Ben Shalom. So, it looks like Amir Khan is not going to retire. There was a theory that Khan only exercised the Brook rematch clause so he could get a step-aside payment to allow Brook to fight Conor Ben. But we could throw that out the window because Eddie Hearn said, nah, you guys can jog on, we're not going to do that. So he wants to fight again. Now, whether Kel Brook will be the opponent, I don't know. I think, look, Brook may want to fight him again, but he may want to make Amir wait and make him stew like how Khan made him stew for that fight so long. He might taunt Amir for a little while. And I couldn't blame him really because Khan taunted Brook for so long. And... Although Amir was very gracious post-fight, took his defeat like a man, I did say that Khan's not going to be able to rest easy on this one. You know, he was the king of England, never lost to a British fighter. I'm not even sure if he lost to a Brit, even as an amateur. And he had a 101-9 and record, 9 losses, 101 wins, including victories over Ugas, Victor Ortiz. I recall him getting decked as an amateur by Craig Watson a British opponent but he got back up to win so losing to a Brit who's got these bragging rights over him I knew Amir Khan wouldn't be able to just sit down and retire on that Amir Khan has been getting floored for a long time way before he got to world title level that Moroccan guy decked him he's not often credited for a knockdown but he decked him Michael Gomez decked him Willie Limon decked him Brady's Prescott knocked him out. Danny Garcia got him, etc., etc. And he's been knocked out or stopped a few times. So it's not like Roy Jones, where from after he got robbed in the Olympics in 88, he went through the 90s undefeated and didn't get beaten until 2003. And then after that, he had that bad phase in his career where he suffered all them knockouts. Amir Khan's been getting knocked down for a long time, consistently through every phase of his career. And if he continues on, it's not going to take world-class fighters to knock him out. That's what I believe. It's them demons, isn't it? Them boxers got them demons. Like, they're trying to right the wrongs. Like, trying to address the knockout loss and prove that he hasn't got a glass chin or prove that he's still got it. And it's the ego basically trying to overcome common sense and vice versa. But we're going to have fun watching it because... He's going to be in fights where he's going to be vulnerable. And that's half the fun of watching this dude. So I don't mind if he carries on. Not one bit. In the article, Ben Shalom says that we will help him on whatever he decides to do. What does that mean? That means they're going to broadcast his fights if he comes back. Because it's must-see TV. Not pay-per-view. There's no more pay-per-views out there for him. But it's must-see. And Ben wants to have the broadcasting rights on that. Because how do they match him? You can't go way, way, way down the pecking order because Sky and Amir Khan are going to come in for criticism and the punters are going to say, no, we're not going to pay for that. So you have to give him half-decent opposition and half-decent opposition means a potential knockout loss for Amir Khan. The truth will set you free, let you see the light. There's no need to watch TV tonight. I don't know if Spence is a man of God, but what I believe burnt him about what Blair Cobbs had to say if Blair was saying, you're being cursed, as well as being a coward, you're being cursed for ducking Crawford. Look at Aperture, car accident, eye injury, miss out on the Pacquiao fight. He said he messed up boxing. That must have hit right at the core of Errol Spence's soul, what he said there. Errol Spence fired back at Blair Cobbs on Sunday in reaction to his negative comments. He dismissed Blair as a 33-year-old prospect and told the media... Stop being so thirsty in looking for news. Is that the same media who you have no problem with assisting you to duck Terence Crawford almost religiously? Kind of it both ways. The only way Spence is getting away with ducking Terence Crawford is he has pockets of media and fringe media with YouTube channels, websites and whatever they have at their disposal normalising his ducking of Terence Crawford. 
That's the only way he's getting away with it. So if they weren't so thirsty to defend Errol Spence, maybe it'd go and take the fight. Can't have it both ways. You call him a coward, afraid. He said Spence has been dealing with alcoholism and has lost the fighting spirit. I tell you what, yeah? This is to any Errol Spence fans listening to this portion of the video. Many people don't get through this far into one of my weeklies. They don't. The attention deficit drop-off must be around the 18 minute mark. But if you're still here and you're an Errol Spence, an extreme Errol Spence fan, what Blair Cobb said is the kind of talk that would take Errol Spence out of his comfort zone and fight Crawford. Because he has to get out of his comfort zone to fight Crawford. He has to. And all this Yes, Errol, free bags, full Errol, damage control. No matter what he does, is not getting him any closer to fighting the likes of Terence Crawford. Errol says, Y'all listening to a 33-year-old prospect. Media has to stop being so thirsty for content. Nigga looks up to Ric Flair, said Errol Spence on Twitter in responding to Blair Cobbs. And I read, buddy, backstory. If I'm cursed, what the fuck do you think is going on with him? It's not so much... In my opinion, how great Blair Cobbs is as a boxer is how his words are being received by Errol Spence and how it's affecting him and how other people are receiving what he's saying and how his fan base know, know that Blair just said a lot of shit that a lot of people may have been afraid to say. Yeah, maybe Blair should be further along at this stage of his career. Maybe so. Maybe he's not as talented as Errol Spence. Not many fighters are. But that's the frustrating thing, isn't it? How is someone with the talent, blessed with that talent, not challenging himself against Crawford, not giving us that all-American showdown that we so crave? This is why Jaime Mangia is not committing to fighting Jamal Charlo or Andrade, because he has a bunch of Mexican friendly media and fans who don't want them fights to happen unless... The probability is Jaime will win. That maybe Jamal or Demetrius have deteriorated that badly. The Jaime can just get in there and wipe them out and claim their scalps. And Errol Spence is no different amongst the African Americans who support him and support the PBC. He's been hiding behind that fringe element of media, saying it's Crawford's fault for the fight not happening. And it clearly isn't. I've heard the name Blair. Cobbs, he's obviously an eccentric, and I have no expectations about him becoming no great welter. I don't think it's going to happen at 33 years of age, but the words he said resonated like a Bible scripture, as far as I'm concerned. Today was the day I actually heard him say it out of his own mouth while he was doing his open workout. And because he is an eccentric and he's not swayed by the principles that the PBC boxers and fans claim they have, it's just like, ah, ah, it's hard. It's real. You can't deflect the power of what he said by judging him as an individual or his boxing career. You can't. When the message is real, it often doesn't matter who's saying it when the message is real.